and we're here at uh, Laguna Hills Nursery in Santa Ana, Saturday morning. And today's talk is on growing roses. The, uh, you can make it, a theme is you can make it as easy as you want or as difficult as you desire. So first thing we'll talk about is some of the, you now modern roses were invented about 100, about 100 years ago. Uh, we started getting roses that look like the ones we sell today. So, you know, there are, the old roses were a lot simpler looking, uh, but today we grow what are called, well, the most popular rose typically is called a hybrid tea. And hybrid teas generally, once they're mature in the garden, will grow about four foot to six foot tall, somewhere in that range. One flower per stem is what is desired and that's good you know what people want when they put them in a vase is one stem per one flower per stem so hybrid teas are by far what we concentrate our our uh, supply of the other category we have would be floribunda and this rose is a typical floribunda where it comes in clusters sometimes up to 20 or even 30 roses in a cluster. So not as easy to make a cut flower out of it, although you still can certainly do that. This is a bigger stem with a lot of more weight on the end of it. Um, then we have what are called climbers, which are vine-like roses that'll grow stems between say five and 15 foot long, sometimes longer than that. That also have the flowers on them. Um, we do have what are called tree roses, and literally these are just, the stem is from a, a climbing rose, and on top of it, they cut that off and graft on several branches of whatever rose you want. This is a hybrid tea on the, grafted two or three times on the top of the stem. So they're actually bushes growing on top of a long stem. And this is classified as a miniature rose, although I would call it more of a shrub rose. Uh, miniature roses flower smaller than two inches in general and plants shorter than two feet. Well, this one can grow a little bigger than that, but still across most of the country where roses aren't as vigorous, it'll stay within the size of a miniature rose. This is called gourmet popcorn. Lately, um, the hot sellers have been the shrub roses, which are just grown for ease of, you know, they're, they're sold because they're easy to grow, they don't have diseases. The flowers tend to be real simple. So this is more of the wild rose look where there's not as many petals, uh, but the plants are, are extremely disease free. <coughs> So the top selling rose in the United States is one that's used in green belts rather than in home gardens. It's, it's known as knockout. And uh, it's got a red flower that's similar to this one. Uh, and it grows maybe three foot. This is a ground cover rose called uh, flower carpet. This was developed in the 1990s in response to the complaints that everyone had about all the rose diseases that, uh, you know, it's interesting what happened, the reason why roses got such a bad reputation, I think, is that most of the breeders moved to California uh, because our climate here is wonderful for roses. We did not have back in the 60s and 70s black spot, a lot of the diseases that plagued the roses back east weren't here. So the rose breeders were in California developing roses perfectly suited to our climate, but horrible for the rest of the country. So oh, no. in fact, uh, Jackson Perkins in that, in that time, that era was the, the biggest nursery in the world. I mean, literally they sent a catalog to every household in the US. Um, and their breeding grounds were in Irvine. Mm -hmm. So they were growing roses perfect for Southern California, weren't surviving too well 
anywhere else without a lot of uh, disease prevention and, and maintenance. So uh, they got smart after that, but by that, you know, the rose industry was huge in the 80s and early 90s, and then it kind of crashed after that because of the thought by most people, belief by most people that roses were too high maintenance. Well, that's because they were all bred in California for California weather, which is a lot drier. So the rose breeders got smart and moved out of Southern California and started having test gardens across the country so that they can better evaluate the health of their roses. And still on some catalogs, they say, okay, this rose is better on the West Coast than it is back East because of the diseases. So. Okay, so introduction to roses. Um, yeah, nowadays we're starting to grow roses again. The breeders are certainly bringing us more roses that are more less prone to diseases. So it's become a little nicer again to grow roses, but there is a new critter in town that's causing a lot of trouble called a chili trip, and we'll go over that as we cover disease itself. As far as planting roses goes, you know, how to choose a site. I mean, both people think they have to make a rose bed, a bed dedicated to roses. Well, that's fine. I mean, the advantage and dis disadvantage of that is that if you're all together and you're spraying, then it's easier just to spray the roses rather than everything else around them. But the disadvantage of having rose beds is the prevalence of bugs and diseases is a lot higher if they're all stuck together. So, uh, you know, I've grown roses singly in a lawn or singly among fruit trees, and those roses rarely have diseases that the roses in the beds do. So diseases generally are spread from plant to plant more easily than they are from, you know, part of your garden to another. So single roses tend to get diseased less than the ones that are in beds. But a lot of the roses look better if you have a whole bunch of them around. So that's, you know, that's a compromise there. Um, and, you know, they always say morning sun is, I, you know, is essential for roses and afternoon sun is not. So, um, you know, the ideal bed is on the east side, southeast side of a house where they get sun all morning and then the heat of the day passes by and they're in more shade at that time. That's ideal for a lot of the roses for the flowers. The plants would rather be out there in full sun all day, but some of the flowers do suffer, they fade, some flowers burn, some flowers, you know, it's interesting, some rose varieties love the heat. The hotter it is, the better they look. But other <coughs> types of roses uh, fade so badly and some are actually, the flower buds are cooked by the heat coming off a hot pavement or wall masonry. So, you know, there's certain roses you have to look, look in certain areas. Like I had a, my former father-in-law, my late father-in-law lived in Hemet, and they grew all the roses in total shade. And they look fine. Um, and I've grown a lot of roses myself in the wrong parts of the garden, parts that only got sun between houses, places that only got sun for a few hours, they do okay. So, uh, you know, if you want perfect roses, you put them out in more sun, but it's not essential to have a nice flower. So, so the site, now the soil should be well drained, even if it's clay, if the water tends to collect there when it rains, the rose plants it doesn't kill them, they just don't grow very fast or very well, they just sit there I had a spot lower than my sidewalk at the first house I had, and um, they just didn't do much there. They were short, you know, short stemmed. They didn't repeat bloom very well. So what we did with that bed is we put a few blocks in front of it, raised it six inches, and it became perfect. Just by raising the whole bed about six inches above the sidewalk level, actually it's only about four inches, above the sidewalk level uh, and made that bed into one of my best beds. So just a little bit of height really helps the drainage if, if you're sitting in a puddle. Um, 
Now, the one thing good about roses is they tolerate just about any type of soil, so clay, sand, uh, even uh, soil that's mostly compost, they'll live in it. Most plants do not like to live in soil that contains too much compost, but roses, they look okay in that. They're not at their best, but they look okay. So if you want to know, you know what the ideal soil is, which may not be ideal, would be a sandy soil. So most florist roses are grown in sand, but th what that promotes is large flowers, really long stems. So in my last house they lived at, I decided to try that. So we had a, a bed and I redid a bed, put in mostly sand, put the rose in there and they all grew like twice as tall as they should have. <laughs> in the front yard, that didn't look right. You know, when, you're, when your floor abundance are like this, instead of about three feet, they were like five, six foot tall. My hybrid tees were taller than that. It's like, okay, that looks kind of strange in the front yard. So it depends what you want them to do but florists grow roses in sand because they want the long stems. I mean, I had a customer who said he lived in Saudi Arabia as an oil consultant. He was a drilling expert, and he had his uh, motorhome parked in the sand, and he grew roses since they were taller than his motorhome. Mm. Wow. So, in the sand. So, <coughs> sand is fine, yes. What do they like about sand? Did they react that way? Well, so all plants, the on a lot of vigor is due to root health. And the roots are healthiest if they get more air to them. So roots on plants have to breathe oxygen. And so the, more, the better way, you know, like hydroponics, that's grown in rocks and gravel and uh, volcanic rock and sand and perlite, just because the more air you get to the roots of a plant, the faster and more vigorous it grows, the more frequently you have to water it. They don't need more water, they just need more frequent water because rocks and sand don't hold water quite as well as clay or peat moss. But so there there are some drawbacks to growing in sand, but not necessarily in the you know on the ground, it's not a big deal. The, the thing about sand is that it doesn't hold as much water per foot, but roots on plants can grow deeper in sand than they can in clay because they can breathe better. So there it's a it's it's a wash. Uh, but they'll certainly grow taller uh, with longer stems in the sand, so that the florist people know that. So. Okay, the one thing you have to watch out for when you're planting a rose garden is that if you've had roses there before, you plant, replant up, they were there like more than three years, and you pull them out and you put a new rose in there, it doesn't grow. It refuses to grow. So the American Rose Society um, kind of addressed that back in the 80s when I was first started growing roses called the rose replant syndrome. And they said, yeah, if you grow the rose in the same soil over and over, they don't like it at all. And so the, you know, the members commented, we see it. Some of the members say, no, we don't see it. Well, the ones that didn't see it were because they had grown their roses in whiskey barrels first so they had a bunch of soil, new soil in that whiskey barrel, and then they, after that they put them in the ground. Well, there was so much soil going with them into the ground, there was no sign of any dead rose roots. But if you have a rose that's grown in the ground for three or four years, there's so many roots in that soil, and you remove that rose, now all these little roots are dying, and you put a baby rose in the middle of that, it doesn't like to be around dead relatives. So. <laughs> The roses I would put into those beds would sit there, bloom once, and not grow an inch or bloom the rest of the year. Sitting right next to one of the original roses that was doing fine. And so I saw it. I said, boy, that rose is never going to do a thing again. Uh, I didn't know what the cure was at that time because they didn't mention anything. And then we found out later, yeah, one of my um, employees in the 90s, our rose, who was our rosarian at the store in the 90s says, well, I've got a hundred rose rose garden. Every time I put a new rose in, I put one bag of our acid mix into the hole to replace the old soil, and my roses do fine. So this is uh, one cubic foot of soil in the zone where the old rose was. Just take that soil out, don't reuse it, put in, quote, 
virgin soil, no dead rose roots in it, and, uh, and he says that he got very good results with that. So we kind of use that as a standard now. Uh, if you have, if you're replanting a rose into that bed. Now, what I did in my original bed, because I didn't know how to cure it, uh, I just knew what was happening. I pulled out all the roses in one section and put in hibiscus, which did fine. So if the plant's not related, it doesn't care if there's, the hibiscus didn't care if there was dead rose roots in the ground, just roses cared, or anything close related to roses cared about that. Didn't like all that. You know, anytime you have dead pieces of a plant, it attracts the diseases that affect those dead pieces. It's like, if we die, we make sure we get rid of all the little body parts. We don't want them anywhere around us because they'll attract all the diseases that can affect people. So the same thing with plants. You don't want little pieces of them around the, especially around the young baby plants that are there. So an old rose that's established and you kill a plant next to it, it's got roots going off five feet in all directions. Just that little bit of dead stuff just doesn't seem to affect it too much. But a new one going in is severely affected. So make sure you, you know, if you replant, replant a rose, or replant anything, you change the soil on it. it doesn't have to be our ass to mix. You can just dig a hole in another part of your garden and exchange the dirt. As long as there is no rose growing in the area, that dirt is fine for the new rose. Okay. So setting up the roses now. This time here we're, we're dealing with container roses. Just have, you know, again, they're not super sensitive to the soil quality. If you make a hole deep enough to get this root ball on the ground, that's deep enough. So that's about 10 inches of soil, one shovel deep essentially. Uh, the hole wide enough. As long as your soil is, you know, because our roses are growing in perfect soil, you don't have to worry about your soil being perfect. Now, if I bought this rose from another company and the soil wasn't perfect, you might need to make the soil around it more perfect so that the roots don't rot from the grower's bad soil. We use, again, we use perfect soil, but most growers use wood-based soils. And because of that, you need to get the soil aerated around here so that you don't get so much rot on the roots. And that's essentially like putting our mix have to be half volcanic rock. So if you mix that into the ground or just use it straight around the sides of a rose from other growers, it'll aerate the roots, keep them airy enough so that that wood doesn't cause root rot on your plant. But in general, roses are pretty easy going about the soil quality, so. Now it's not that they're tolerant it's just that they can redo the root system so quickly. So uh, back before I knew anything about dirt, I thought, you know, those were the days in the 80s, the more compost you put in the ground, the better your soil. So I had a rose bed that, I had a raised planter, in fact, that was about this high. And the soil level was about halfway up. So what I, I did is I, brought a whole bunch of compost and mixed it with the soil below it and made my soil rose bed as rich as I thought it might be. I could make it. Planted my roses in that. They look fine. They grew relatively, you know, I would say a little on the short side, maybe four foot instead of five or six foot. They grew about four foot, but they look fine. But when I pulled one out about five years later, I noticed that it had roots a good network of roots this far down and below that all the roots are black and slimy they all died below three inches and I thought Boy, did I plant my roses too deep well that that's so I didn't realize at the time what was going on I thought I had planted my roses too deep and they re grew a whole bunch of rose roots near the surface but that's what the compost did uh, when you have compost in the ground there's no oxygen left below a few inches the roots can survive below three they regrew in the mulch layer of that bed, the surface mulch, I had it covered with about three inches of redwood sawdust. And uh, they look fine, even though they had lost half the root system, they were doing fine. So we think roses are tolerant of bad soil just because they regrow roots in the right spot. <clears throat> so they're real, real good at that. Um, Watering-wise, 
you know, roses have always been said to need plenty of water, but officially their designation is moderate. And they can survive short periods of drought just by dropping their leaves and looking ugly. So after that last drought we had, now we're apparently we're at the start of a new drought, but at the last drought we had, you know, the parks nearby us, they were losing a lot of plants because they had really cut the water back like everybody else during the drought. They're losing things like flax, and a lot of the grasses were dying, the ornamental grasses were dying. Most of the, and day lilies were disappearing. We were surprised. 95% uh, of the roses made it through that. Even though they didn't look good during the drought at all, they were down to just sticks. But as soon as they turned the water back on in, what was it, 2018, a lot of them came back. So we were, we were quite happy with that. That's why they call them moderate, not high water users. Because you know, if we have a drought, you can just the main thing to do is stop fertilizing them and stop deadheading them so that they sit there with their old growth, which needs less water than the new, newer leaves tend to use or lose water much quicker than old leaves. So if you just let them sit there with the rose hips on them, making seed pods, so they don't have much new growth, then they'll use less water, or you can just keep cutting them small so they don't use much water. Uh, as far as fertilizing goes, there's a, you know roses aren't that picky about what you use. Now you can get a you know a fertilizer labeled for roses, and that's fine. Um, we do like the organics better. So in the, my first rose bed, I you know I didn't think there was much to organic fertilizers back in the 80s. They're just now being promoted as being the thing, and I thought, well, I'll just use my ordinary chemical fertilizer, it was called Grow Power. It's organic based, but it's a chemical fertilizer. And within two years, a lot of my roses start showing iron chlorosis. I'm going, oh. So I treat them for iron. And then we switched to organic fertilizers and I never saw that ever happen again. So you go, okay, the organic, there's something to organic fertilizers. Well, in those days, they didn't tell us that plants actually are made out of 17 minerals. You just don't need like all the chemicals, they, they said we're well balanced, we have those three minerals, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, but they forgot about all the rest. There's 12, uh, you know, there's uh, nine others you have to apply. Uh, organic fertilizers have 17 minerals, 13 of which you have to apply. Um, you know, some minerals are in air and water, but the rest, uh, so the organic fertilizers, because these are chopped up plants, um, and pre-digested plants, all 17 are there. Whereas the chemical fertilizers, they will promote three or four, but they're missing a whole bunch. So after that, we just switched to organics uh, and we did quite well. Now there is, so some of the chemical fertilizers that we use nowadays, they realize that they're not complete. So like here at the nursery in these pots, because the organics take longer to start working, we use Osmocote to start them off with, which has 11 of the 12 that you have to add. Now, there's a few things, micronutrients you have to add. You don't have to add nickel. They said basically anything that looks like soil has nickel in it, enough for the plants, and I believe it's aluminum. Uh, no, aluminum's not a micronutrient, so there's something else that uh, we don't have to add either because it's needed in such small quantities. <coughs> so this has pretty much all of them, but still within a year we rather put organic on them because this keeps the soil more alive too. So in nature, uh, the organic fertilizers keeps the soil organisms alive better than a chemical does. Now we also like to mulch the rose beds. So if you're growing roses and the soil around it's bare, by July or August, that soil temperature, you know, rose roots may only grow a few inches deep. Like most plants, they only grow a few inches deep. A lot of the feeder roots are right close to the surface. If you have bare soil around your roses and it's 90 degrees that day, that soil temperature where the roots are could be 120 degrees and your roses absolutely look cooked. 
Now in black plastic pots, that happens in summer because there's no way to keep the black plastic out of the sunlight. They look cooked. Doesn't kill them, but the leaves are kind of <coughs> yellowish, grayish. They just don't look healthy at all. So it's nice to either grow plants around your roses or keep it covered with something to keep the temperature down. Uh, they did studies on mulches and said three inches of some kind of mulch will keep the soil in uh, 40 degrees cooler than if it's bare. And that's a huge difference on root health. Roots do not like to be much above 90 degrees. And they said uh, you know, without the mulch, 120, with the mulch, 85. So it's a huge difference when you, when you put something on top of the ground. And again, plants were, um, in my neighborhood, a lot of people would put this wild type geranium. This is called geranium tiny monster underneath the rose bed. Because these don't like to be in full, full sun. They like to be a little bit cut from the extreme heat, but they love to grow underneath other plants and they only get about six inches tall and they bloom lightly all year heavily in the spring. This is a real nice plant to put around your, the base of your rose. But there's others. I mean, I've grown sweet alyssum, lobelia. Uh, those are only good for a few years. Uh, but there's a lot of short things that you can put around your roses. Uh, I've, I've used day lilies, some of the shorter day lilies. Uh, keep the ground cool, that helps with the root health a lot. Um, and then as far as mulches goes, well, okay. When I had a, a rose bed at my last house, I wanted to make it easier. And what we found we can do and okay, this was once a year when I would do this, I would strip off everything underneath my roses because uh, I wanted to keep it real neat. So I'd strip off all the mulch on top of the ground, which included a lot of flower petals and a lot of dead leaves from the previous year. I do this around the early spring, just peel all that off, throw it underneath the fruit trees in the backyard or underneath my ornamental trees in the backyard, and then redo my rose bed from the dirt up. I would cover it with about an inch of this garden compost, which is actually fairly nutritious. A lot of different green waste in it and uh, some chicken manure, about an inch of that, and then cover it with a couple inches of this bark mulch, which is a very small bark. So a couple inches of that. So the bark mulch would help keep the weeds out, keep the temperature down, uh, keep everything in place. The garden compost would actually feed my roses for the entire year. Just that one inch layer of a mixture of uh, compost, green waste compost and chicken manure uh, and some wood, there's wood in there and rice holes in there also. My rose would grow fine. I mean, they wouldn't stop growing for the next year. And then I would repeat the process every every time I redo the bed. Did you then not have to use the fertilizer? True. I did not. That was the only fertilizer I used. So. Can you put that around the roses themselves? Just covered the whole bed with it. So the roots had access to it, and then the, the bark on top, and that kept them well fed. Can I ask you about the liquid? Fish fertilizer? That's good stuff. You, you just have to that? do it a lot. It says every two weeks at a certain period of month. So do you recommend that or is this does this suffice this fertilizer that you showed? I didn't see any problems doing this. I mean my roses just kept growing, they kept blooming. How so. often do you use the granular the the Dr. Earth? This one, uh, I think it says on here once a season or once every two two to three months. Really? That's all. Well if you, well, you can put a whole bunch down and go longer if you want to. Okay. <laughs> Rose, you know, most organic fertilizers uh, don't work super fast, and they last a long time. So it depends what you use. I mean, I remember on my in my backyard once I had a broken back chicken. I just threw the whole thing underneath one tree in my backyard. I had to fertilize that tree for three years. So things can last a long time. I mean, if you have a good mulch layer on top of the ground. In theory, that in itself, that's how nature feeds plants. Just having that mulch layer on top at all times, you don't need any other input. So 
So does that compost help all the other plants then around the roses? Oh yeah. yeah all, most plants operate on the same system, so you can do the same. What about azaleas? Do they? Eat that? No? That's a different question. That's a different topic. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> azaleas sometimes don't work in certain situations because they don't have the right fungus in the roots to help break down. They can't get the nutrients and they need a certain mycorrhizal fungus to help them. And so you might have to go chemical on azaleas. We learned that the hard way. Yeah, we do it. Um, do you know when to replenish your soils? Well, when the roses slow down and the leaves turn pale or green, then you know, you know, when they're not blooming too well, you know, usually you cut them and so on a, on a typical rose, the cycle is, is, what is it? One bloom, if you cut off this flower, the next flower should bloom within 10, well, every, what is it? Six weeks between blooms is the average. You cut off a flower, you should be back to the same stage in six weeks, that's the average. It's faster in summer, four weeks, it's slower in winter, maybe about 10 weeks. But six weeks is the average if your rose, so you cut your rose, should have another flower there in six weeks. If it doesn't, if it's doing, if it's taking its time or the leaves are getting pale on you, then you know you have to fertilize it again. So, yes. Is it true if you're using organic and commercial, the commercial kills all the good stuff in the organic? It's possible. So. What we know is that the organic systems use the fungus that breaks down the fertilizer and puts it back in the plant. And if you use chemical fertilizers that have too much phosphorus, like for some reason they've got stuck on saying, well, you need that high middle number to make your flowers. No, you don't. You need all the numbers in the right ratio to make your flowers. The middle number of phosphorus, if it's a chemical phosphorus and it's way high, like there is a product called 0, 050 0 and 10 and 10 30 10 both of them all blooms well that highly soluble phosphorus will kill the mycorrhizal fungus so the mycorrhizal fungus can't do the work and then the plants totally dependent on you fertilizing it every week with something to get it going because the phosphorus has wiped out the, the you know the system that's supposed to be set up so a 10-10-10 probably wouldn't affect the organic. Over a long time, a 10-10-10, the phosphorus will build up and wipe you out, but it might take a while. It won't happen right away. So we don't like to use chemical fertilizers with high phosphorus numbers, like 14-14-14, 20-20-20. The gardeners love 20-20-20. It looks, the plant makes the plants look great because phosphorus is hard for the mycorrhizae or the plants to pick up. But if you overload it and keep overloading it, then you wipe them out. So then you're, the thing that's trying to get it for your roses or your plants uh, is, is compromised. So, so yeah, stay with organic, it's better. My roses, are, the leaves are all turning yellow. Why? And I look it up and for the different reasons, but well, the leaves are taking green. So this time of year, a lot of plant leaves are turning yellow and there's a reason for that. So. Um, like hibiscus right now, dropping a lot of yellow leaves. Uh, a lot of tropicals are dropping out. What happened this winter is December was cold. And because December was cold, you know, there might have been an average of 55 all, all month or something, and the soil at night got really cold on plants. So you, lost, you lose a lot of feeder roots on plants when that happens. So the feeder roots, when the soil gets cold in winter, it takes a long time for the roots to recover. Usually they say, you know, roots are fine at the, are the, you have your most extensive roots at the end of the year, the rose, you know, the plants have grown the roots all year long, so the roots are the best at the start of winter, but then the winter kills a lot of them off, and they don't recover well until the next summer. All their, their entire root system begins, so in the spring, they're trying to grow, but they got no roots. So what the plants are doing is they're taking all the nutrition out of the old leaves and moving them to the new growth at the tips because their roots aren't operating yet. So the old leaves are turning yellow because the plant's stealing all the nitrogen out of those leaves to make the new leaves. 
So we see a lot of that going on this year. Plants and containers even more affected the ones in the ground because containers got really cold this winter. So the roots in there are gone, really. They, they have to grow a whole new set of roots. And it's still kind of cool at night, so they're, they're not able to do that yet. So we're seeing a lot of plants dropping yellow leaves, not only roses, uh, but a lot of leaves from last year are just turning yellow and dying, and then the plant's making new leaves. So the new growth looks fine, but uh, just because they've stolen the nutrients from the older leaves, as soon as the soil warms up a little more, say May, May is when the soil temperatures usually reach close to 70 degrees, and then the plants look fine by then. Um, that was kind of noted by the palm societies for a while. They said, oh, we can't make the palms green up at all until May. They can't pick up any fertilizer. They don't have any good roots. <laughs> the soil's got to be, they said, 70 degrees for the palm roots to uh, revive. So anyway. OK, so pruning roses. Now, they used to have pamphlets and little booklets dedicated to showing you how to prune rose properly. And now what it is is a flyer that shows you how to prune a rose with a chainsaw. <laughs> so they learned over time that all the pruning techniques that they did were not as essential to making better flower. I mean, what they did, the, the, the test they did, the, the test that changed everyone's mind, in England, they had the Royal Horticultural Society, they had their best rosarians pruning 50 of the same rose on this side. And they had a machine on this side just cutting off the tops of the roses every few weeks. So, yeah, so no brains on this side. The best <laughs> rosarians on this side, and they wanted it, they counted the quality flowers made on each side for a number of years, and there was no difference. The flowers on this side were just as nice and as numerous as the ones on this side. So they did it another five years and said, there's got to be a difference. So they did five more years of this. And still no difference. So they gave up. They said, okay, the techniques we're using were, aren't that important. <coughs> it sure is important to get to deadhead them. So you want to get rid of the old yeah. flowers in order so they don't make a seed pod. Uh, that's the main thing that you need to do when you prune a rose back. Now, the traditional method of pruning a rose is to cut it back. So on a hybrid tea like this, what they would tell you is cut it back to the first five leaflet leaves. So the leaves near the top, you can see these only have three leaflets on the leaf. And if you cut to here, any stem that grows out of these nodes won't have enough energy to make a nice flower like this again. The ones below it can. So they said the first life, five leaflet leaf, and they always say to the first five leaflet leaf on the outside of the stem so that the stem doesn't go toward the middle of the rose, which is aesthetically not as pleasing, go toward the outside. Now, even if you do that, sometimes an inner bud will break and grow on the inside. They don't always do what you want them to. But they would tell us the outside leaf, five, first five leaf leaf, prune it that one. Now the florists have a different take on it. They said, oh, we need a longer stem. We want the longest straight stem possible. So they would cut it to the last five leaf at leaf on that same stem. They wouldn't go lower than that. They would go to the last five leaf at leaf near the base of this branch. So they would force the plant to grow a longer stem, which takes longer but a bigger flower also. So the longer they have to grow, you force them to grow, the longer it takes to get the flower, but the bigger flower and the longer the stem. So it depends what you want. Now in Minnesota, you know, they don't have a four month window to grow roses. So they said, don't cut off any leaf, just deadhead them. Save every leaf you can because we don't have time to make new leaves. Now here, our rose season is 365 days a year. So you can really butcher your rose constantly to keep it looking good. How It'll just regrow. Every, every time it's bloomed? Pardon? For every time the blooms die, you do the same thing over and over again? Right. Just well, at least deadhead them. Just take off. And that's down to the five leaves. Yeah. Or just.
pick off the dead, the dead flower, that's fine too. So you'll get other branches that maybe not make a nice as rose, but you'll still get plenty of roses coming out of this. Yes. If you have old roses that have the big um, stem canes, can you hack those off down way low or does it kill the plant? Yeah, the problem with, okay, so as roses age, they go from this nice green stem to a stem covered with gray bark, and it gets real corky after a while. That old stem tends not to sprout new growth as easily, and sometimes if that's all you have left and you cut off all your green growth, the old growth refuses to sprout anymore, and then you're stuck. You, you got no rose left. Now, just so you know, roses, usually we tell people, you get a good 10 years out of a rose plant if it's everything's healthy, or the soil's right and everything, you'll get a good 10 years out. Beyond that, you know, their, their performance can suffer, although we have a lot of customers who say, my roses are 25 years old, still doing good. So it depends. Some roses are real good at making new green stems out of the base, and some roses just don't do it very well. Uh, you, know, you just never know. But sometimes it's just that one plant. You know, I had a... Uh, uh, Princess of Monaco that just refused to make another stem. I'm going, come on, <laughs> just had one. It last, it just stayed there with one stem for ten years. It would not make more stems or canes. So some roses are just like that. Yes. When you cut, if you were going to cut that single stem rose for your vase and sign, wouldn't you cut it down to a fine leaf right above it at an angle? Right. So well, yeah, the angle is not super important, but so yeah. that's not important. So you well, okay. So if you if you want to be really perfectionist, so if you have a rose stem and you got a leaf, five leaf of leaf, and you will, and here's the potential bud that'll make a new stem. Yeah, you can. I mean, we just cut, but if you want to be perfect about cutting this stem. The way the, the textbooks had is you start right across from that bud and you go upwards at a 45 degree angle so that when this new growth comes out, it'll come out like this and there won't be this bump on the other side of the stem. It's just aesthetics. You know? Or the bark can grow over that wound quicker. But on a, you know, if it was a tree, we do it this way. I mean, you know, if you have a tree that structurally has to be perfect, you would prune it perfectly, just so that you don't have these things sticking out. You have the bark covering it real nicely. Roses, it's just not a big deal if the branch is weak because you cut it wrong. It's not a big deal. I mean, to some people it is. But to us, I mean, after pruning roses, you know, I started growing roses for my dad in the 80s. And it's, it's like, First few, first 20 years, I was a perfectionist. I had to do everything right. I didn't want a single black spot leaf, a single sign of mildew. It's like, I don't care anymore <laughs> if it's perfect. Uh, my, my first rose garden, I mean, that, I spent hours on it every week to keep it per I had 50 roses, I wanted to be perfect. And unfortunately, there was a florist neighborhood, and he kept picking my roses. I said, well, this is stupid. <laughs> so I started punching holes in all my leaves with the, uh, paper cutter so he wouldn't steal my roses because <laughs> uh, my neighbor said yeah this forest band pulls up and cuts off 20 of your roses takes them with them so <laughs> so that's the that's the downfall of having perfect roses but uh, anyway. is it important to cut the, the, the fifth leaf though for your stem or does it not matter had it right above the fifth, whether it's at an angle or not, or does it really matter? It looks I'm a little better. I'm taking my mother who had roses back in yeah, the 60s. Yeah, too, so it looks a little better if you cut police. it close to that, but if you cut it up here, the rose will still operate, right? Okay. It's just not that big a deal. Now, there is a bug out there. I haven't seen it lately, but in my neighborhoods, my first neighborhood I lived at, there was a bug called a raspberry cane borer. Every time I cut a rose stem that was thicker than a pencil, it would drill it out a couple inches deep so that the top bud wouldn't sprout, it would be further down, and I noticed the end of my rose stem would die off, and there was a hole in there. So that's a raspberry cane borer. I haven't seen it in this area much. 
I don't see it. You know, a lot of areas don't have this critter, but if you do, what the what the rope size says, just take some white glue and put it on the tip. Uh, nail polish works. Pruning tar works. A piece of tape works. Anything to cover the wound so this cane borer can't, because the cane borer larva eats out the soft tissue and the stem. So that was prevalent a long time ago. I haven't seen it much lately, but just wear, be aware it's there in case you do see it. So, so white glue, that's. Me and my wife grow, we have a garden. She, she'll put a Peruvian dahlia in my little garden. That's, that just makes sense, right? <laughs> okay, I have. I've had I mean, that thing will spread, and it's <laughs> taking over my roses, and they don't like competition. Am I right or wrong? True. Well, they have trouble with other big plants near them, like trees and you know, other big shrubs can cause trouble. But yeah, I mean, my wife planted uh, Mexican primrose in my rose garden. I'm going, my God, <laughs> you know, yeah, that thing grows underground and comes up all over the place. So anyway, right. You, you live with your wife. <laughs> so anyway, um, do what you can. Okay, so as far as uh, pests and diseases goes, um, back in the 80s, everything was easier. I mean, we had, we were growing at that time uh, especially in the early 90s, 10,000 roses at our, at our nursery we were selling that many. I mean, we're selling a lot of roses. Uh, and that's when the roses were the, the biggest thing around. Uh, and it was real simple, the controls, because we didn't have any bad diseases here and we didn't have any bad bugs. Uh, so all we had to do was I got out my tank sprayer. Now tank sprayers like this are needed if you have a lot of roses. Uh, there are uh, gas powered and battery powered ones like this. But all we do is take an oil, this all seasons oil, which, you know, before the 1980s, the oils would burn roses because they were filthy oils. But in the 80s, they brought out these really clean oils. Uh, it's a mineral oil. They took out, what they did is they took out all the sulfur as much as they can so that, because sulfur and oil is a combination that burns leaves. If you take out the sulfur, the oil doesn't burn the leaf very easily at all. So, but the oils tend to wipe out the mildew. Mild, mildew hates oil on the leaf. Uh, most bugs can't live underneath the layer of oil, so it would suffocate most of the bugs on the roses. And we'd add to this, uh, it was about four tablespoons of oil it might have been a little bit higher than that. It might have been four ounces of oil for you know, I'll have to look it up. But I believe it was four tablespoons of oil, one tablespoon of baking soda, because baking soda at that time was noted that if you mixed it and applied it to your plant, it would help control mildew for a few extra days. But we do this once a week on the roses. It would make the leaves really shiny. The oil would make them really glossy. I mean, they look perfect. And this is the only thing we had. And this is rated organic. So everything was organic. Um, and the roses were real beautiful. And we were happy. And then in 1990, black spot showed up. Now, for most homeowners, black spot is not the big issue. So, you know, mildew, most of you have, who grow roses have seen mildew. We get mildew usually April through June. And it shows up looking like this little white, yeah. crisp, looks like powdered sugar on the leaves. Mm -hmm. A little bit on this leaf. We're, it's not mildew season yet, so we're not seeing too much of it. But uh, a few of the leaves have some of this, what looks like a white coating on the leaf. And that's the first sign of mildew, which is a disease that likes dry, humid weather. Doesn't like water, it likes dry, humid weather. So it wasn't so, you know, so we're famous for that because we're by the coast here. Uh, we like this weather, but it's overcast in the morning and doesn't get so hot. 
but the mildew likes that too. Uh, so, but the oils controlled that quite well. But in the 1990s, black spot came in, and what black spot looks like on your leaf, rose leaflet, you get this fuzzy black spot forming, surrounded by yellow. And uh, now it's really a disease only seen in crowded rose gardens or in nurseries where the roses are can to can when we plant them, because the leaf doesn't dry off. Um, if the leaf is wet from late winter rains, like we just had late winter rain, and the weather is not real cold. Now, if it's 40 degrees and it's raining, you don't get any diseases. It's too cold. The diseases like to be a little bit less cold, although there is one that likes it cold. But black spot usually shows up around this time of year if it's raining on roses that leaves that don't dry off for at least four hours. So if you water them at night and they don't draw off until the next noon, then you're in trouble. If you water in the morning around eight and they dry off by noon, there's no problem. So it's a uh, black spot, you can avoid that in most gardens just by the timing of the watering. But if we have a late rain or if your rows are real close together and they don't dry off, we get this fuzzy black spot, slowly the leaf turns yellow, it falls off. It can affect the stems of the rows, uh, cause little purple or red markings on the stems, and then that stem is infected, you gotta cut that off. Uh, back east, it's a major problem because they get rain all year. Uh, sometimes they're just trimming the roses down to nubs, trying to get rid of the black spot. So when that came into California, we had to start using chemicals. We didn't have a real good cure for black spot. That was a not that was an organic cure, other than pruning a rose to disappear. <laughs> so we started using chemicals, and then in the mid '90s. So this is black spot. So we didn't have black spot until 1990. Well, they said it was late 80s, but we didn't see it till the early 90s. And suddenly we had to start spraying for more things. And then uh, mid 90s, downy showed up. Now, it's called downy mildew, but it doesn't look like the regular rose <coughs> at all. If you're in New Jersey, where the humidity is 90%, you would this would look fuzzy. In California, you don't see the fuzz on at all and it likes the cool wet weather. All you see is kind of a vague purple blotch on the leaf. Let's see if I can find any. We saw a few leaves this winter that, because it didn't rain very much, so this winter was actually very clean for us, but it was a vague purple blotch and the leaf turns yellow and falls off. And it can totally, def you know, when it came here in the mid 90s, it was defoliating entire nursery stocks. Everybody was panicking. I remember um, Heinz Nursery in Irvine, on their pruners, they had these little squirt things. Every time they pruned, it would squirt bleach onto their pruner because <laughs> they didn't know what was causing this downy thing. So they were keeping their pruners cleaned. Every time they pruned, it was like, whoa, you know, almost as bad as COVID. I mean, they were yeah. just, they were, they were trying everything to do to stop this downy. Well, you know, so anyway, someone found out that it doesn't like heat. So one of the methods that we're using back east, like in Maine, they said, oh, we just connected our hose to the hot water from our hot water heater and hit the rose with it. It smells like they're cooking out there with 120 degree water, but it sure killed, killed the downy. So heat, you know, they don't like heat. So once we hit, I mean, we've had 80 degrees here and there all spring, all winter, in fact, so that's kind of stopped the downy mildew itself. 80 degree weather, they don't like it. So our, our heat waves through this winter kind of kept the downy mildew down. But if it's cold and wet, we'll get hit pretty good. Um, a product called Garden Foss is what we use. It's a fertilizer that's used to cure diseases. So it's not very toxic. Um, there's no warning on it. You can spray this on vegetables even the next day because it's actually registered in many states as a fertilizer called garden foss. Um, potassium salts of phosphoric acid and both phosphorus and potassium are fertilizers. Uh, if you raise the phosphorus level in a plant, it helps it fight diseases. So. Are you saying you use that for the mildew also? The downy white? mildew, only downy. Okay. So for us, it's important. 
just to stop that one because the roses are packed so tight together here. For homeowner, you may not have to use this on roses. Now it does kill downy on basil, on impatiens. You know, there's a lot of things getting down. Downy is like the new disease that has come in from other parts of the world that's messing us up. Uh, it's going after a lot of different plants. It's not the same downy as the one that hits roses, but there's a lot of, you know, the impatient one was devastating. The one on basil is devastating. This will stop that. Now, when we had black spot, we started using other uh, rose chemicals. Now, most rose fungicides are good for about 10 years, and then the diseases, by that time, most diseases have become immune or evolved. <coughs> A different form that's immune to the disease just like COVID's doing right now uh, so uh, they have to make new fungicides quite often now this Fungimax was the most important the new it was a new fungicide in the 1990s still works pretty good um, but you know they have new ones coming out all the time that we'll be switching to probably within a few years but right now this is working on most of the rose diseases, mildew, block spot, so-so on downy, rust, it's pretty darn good. So you can see our, we've used it like once in our roses this year. We, you can see they're, they're really nice and clean, no rust, very little disease-wise. So Eagle or Fungimax works quite well. We'd rather not use it in my house. You know, I haven't sprayed any of my roses in my house for decades. I just don't spray them anymore. It doesn't bother me. Uh, it's just I don't need them perfect so but here at the nursery we need them to look sellable so we treat them really well now, neem oil came out in the 90s too as an organic oil versus a mineral oil made from oil you found it right away this burns rose leaves <laughs> and specific roses it burns really bad so some roses are more sensitive than others double delight which is that tree rose there and another uh, bicolor rose called um, Paradise. Super sensitive to neem oil, but we couldn't get anywhere close to them with this one. So we learned that neem oil is, is not the best oil to use. Now neem does have, what's interesting is neem seeds, the oil on neem seeds has high sulfur content, <coughs> which is great for getting rid of mildew, but it tends to burn leaves. So when you, when you smell this, it actually kind of makes you think like you're next to a volcano for a while because of the sulfur in there. So. Now as far as, so that's your diseases. Uh, and because we're dry most of the year and, we're, and mildew is just for a shorter time of the year, the diseases aren't our biggest worry. Um, Bugs are generally the ones we have to deal with more. If you want perfect roses, you have to control the bugs. Now, at my house, again, I really haven't sprayed my roses for a long time. I just haven't had that much bug problems in the setup that I have. But generally, the first bugs you'll see every year are aphids. So on the new bud growth, <coughs> growing tips of your roses, you'll see these little green things. A whole colony of them, sometimes hundreds of them, and it's getting sticky on there. Those are aphids. Um, I don't have a good way to show you a great picture, although I think this picture might be pretty good in here. Um, not the greatest photo. You, in the back, you can see this, but they're green to kind of brass, brassy colored bugs. And they, they multiply, I mean, aphids are the one of the quickest reproducing bugs known because they reproduce asexually and they're born pregnant. They, they, they actually, these entomologists found out that when an aphid is born, it's got a baby in it and that baby has a baby in it. There's five generations being born at one time. So if you have one aphid on, you know, one, they, they, one aphid flies and lands on your plant, it gives birth to these wingless aphids that give birth to other aphids, and within a week or so, you have 100 aphids there. Mm -hmm. And within a couple weeks, there can be thousands of aphids on your roses feeding on the tips. Now, 
In the old days, we used a product called orethene to kill the aphids. The problem with orethene, which is acephate, the chemical is called acephate, you kill the aphids, you promote the spider mites. <laughs> and spider mites are a heck of a lot worse to have than aphids. Spider mites are almost not visible to your eyes, and they suck on individual cells of, your, of the leaves, and so you get this leaf that has a lot of white dots on it because they've sucked out one cell at a time, and then their, their poisons they're putting in when they suck out the leaves start making the edges turn gray, and your whole world just shuts down until you get rid of the spider mites. So we found out if we stop the spring for aphids, we stop getting spider mites. So for a year, for decades, I stopped spring for the aphids. I just let the aphids do their thing. And usually by the time the first bloom was there, they were gone. What happens is the growth of the rose hardens up. They can't suck on them more, so they go and fly away. Or by that time, the good bugs have found them. Usually the good bugs find them. Uh, so the first good bug out is a little midge. I can't remember the name of it. It's, so what you'll notice is that this area, a real sticky area where the little um, uh, aphids are, there is a little yellow maggot, golden maggot that's in there, and it's eating them. This little that size midge lays eggs among your aphids and this monster little tiny orange thing or golden thing runs around eating them. That's the first guy out, but right after that usually we see the larger relative. There's something called a hoverfly. So there's this fly that's colored like a bee that hovers around and it's doing this. You see it doing this. It's hunting for aphids. And its baby is this big green maggot. When I first saw that, I thought, it's got to be something bad. <coughs> but this maggot can eat 20 aphids a day. It's an aph it just cleans up your plant really fast. So if you just leave your roses or you know, other things that eat aphids like hibiscus, just leave them alone, this guy finds them eventually. Now you can, you can attract the good bugs because the aphids excrete sugar. So if you spray sugar water on your roses, all your good beneficial bugs come flying over looking for these aphids. And that'll help you clean them up. I mean, we'll see lace wings, which are those gossamer-like green things that fly around. Mm -hmm. And they have their larvae are called aphid lions. They can actually pinch you pretty good if you get pinched by one of these. But they eat aphids too. And then the ladybug larvae, which look like tiny Gila monsters, they're kind of like the last ones to show up, but they show up. And once you have all these good bugs around, your aphids are clean, you know, you don't get any aphids for the rest of the year. So if you leave them alone, you don't get those things. Now, there is one critter that kind of messes up the scheme in that um, in the springtime, we get what are called Western flower thrips. And, and interestingly, they like the light colored roses. So if you have a red rose, you never see any problems with the red roses, but on the light colored roses, like this one's fairly light, we'll, see, we'll start getting a lot of brown edges to the petals. Like this first set of petals, see it's all brown edged? That, that's probably weather damaged, but if you see that a lot when there's no bad weather, no bad wind and stuff, uh, that's from a little bug called a flower thrip, which are Flying creatures about the size of a sliver, they land on the buds. This is their showing color. Just as the sepals, the green things peel back and show the color, they'll lay 10, 20 eggs right there that hatch out really quick, and their babies will get inside the petals and start sucking on them. Real soft tissue. So the outer petals where they're living get kind of brown edged. So your flower is not perfect. I mean, it doesn't hurt the roads otherwise, but <clears throat> makes them all, all the opening flowers, you have to peel up the hot petals to make that flower look good, which is not that big a deal. But if you want to get rid of it, uh, all you have to do actually is spray the very bud as you open with a product. This is Spinosad soap, it's called. Um, this is Monterey Garden Insect Spray, which is the same thing. It's spinosad and soap. This is just spinosad, no soap. This one doesn't work too well because the roses are so waxy 
uh, you got to have the soap included with it to make it stick. Now, in the old days, we used chemical, regular, regular insecticides. We'd spray the buds for two weeks, and that seemed to kill all the thrips <laughs> off. Now, thrips, uh, part of the life cycle, once they're done sucking on the flower, they drop to the dirt, pupate in the ground, then they fly back up and get on your rose again. Uh, if you spray them for about two weeks, all the opening buds, go out there twice a week, spray all the opening buds, you'll, you'll mess up that whole life cycle, and then you want to treat them the rest of the year for that particular thrip. So we did that in our garden, just sprayed the buds. Now in the old, the old days, we had aerosols. And if you got within six inches of the rosebud with an aerosol, you'd freeze it. That, that, the chemical coming out of aerosol comes out ice cold. <laughs> I would freeze the buds. So you had to stand back, but these don't cause any trouble. Just spray the bud. If you don't, now again, it's just the light colored roses, the creams, the light pinks, uh, the yellows that suffer from that, the reds and the darker colors, no damage on the flower thrips. They don't seem to like the darker colors. <clears throat> so that's the flower thrips. Um, by the coast, there is a major problem with something called a It's in here. Rose slug. So rose slugs take a leaf and pretty much lace it out. They're not actually slugs. They're, it's actually a larva of a little tiny stingless wasp that flies around. I've never seen the wasp. But the, the larva is kind of looks like a green worm. It doesn't look like a slug. There are some, quote, slugs of, that are related that look like, that are slimy, <coughs> gray things that actually look like slugs that attack uh, pear trees and plum trees. But the rose slugs just look green, and it's hard for people to see them. I mean, I remember, I remember this one lady, she brought in the sleep. Look at it, it's all laced out. I don't see a thing on it. I, and then I had to point out to her, there was like 12 rose slugs on this, on this leaf she brought in. She just couldn't see them. She, she goes like that. <laughs> so, so they're, they were more common inland, but they are real common still along the coastline. And they can just lace the leaves out. Uh, of the, they start from the bottom, work their way up. <clears throat> There are natural predators, but you just don't want to see this. The same product, Spinosad, will take care of it. If you spray it once or twice a year, you've pretty much gotten rid of that particular bug. There, in the summertime, there's a, sometimes we have a few caterpillars and grasshoppers that eat the flower buds. Again, spraying with the Spinosad products will stop that too. Cage will get a caterpillar that actually eats leaves too. And the same product and occasionally those big fig beetles the fruit beetles the green big ones they'll eat the flower buds too so. yeah, grasshoppers love tender leaves yeah if you have a true now the green grasshoppers this stuff will take care of they're called katie dids the brown grasshoppers you just have to hand pick them and cut their heads off <laughs> <laughs> there's no chemical we have registered in california that's that can kill a grasshopper. So. Okay, uh, now if you do get the spider mites, spider mites, again, if you spray for aphids, sometimes you get spider mites that make the leaves look pale and gray and it shuts the plant down. Um, before we had the products we have now, we just blast them with water. A good stream of water off of a good hose nozzle hit them every week for three weeks, you've knocked them all off. They can't, they really don't have the ability to climb from 10 feet away back to your rose plant. <clears throat> so that pretty much controlled them. I mean, before we had a lot of chemicals, we used to control mildew the same way, blast with water every day for a while, <laughs> and it would give up. But, um, um, but anyway, for spider mites, oil, a good shot of an oil spray, <clears throat> neem oil or the, Horticultural oils will work quite well on the on the spider mites. You might have to do it twice just because 
it's hard to kill spider mite eggs. But in general, a good shot of oil cleans up the plant pretty nicely. What about the praying mantis? Well, praying mantids are good at eating, you know, when they're young, they eat aphids. When they're older, they'll eat bigger things, but they'll also eat the beneficials too. I had a praying mantis once, it was sitting on a flower. I'm going, okay, gotta watch this thing. Every hornet that came to the flower, I would just eat it. I said, oh, that's good, I eat the hornets. <laughs> but, uh, yes? Um, with your oils, the horticulture <coughs> oil, would I want to use that instead of the neem? Because I have used the neem and I get slight burning. Yeah, the horticulture oil is like There's this oil. burning with that, is that? Right. With this one, we don't see any burning. Now, with any spray, one problem we have, and this shows it, now, does that have a, um, a natural emulsifier in it? Yes, they put a, I believe they put a soap in there with it. I don't need to right. my soap. Right. So this rose is showing a lot of burnt leaves, and that's a chemical burn. Mm -hmm. So I keep forgetting, well, I, I don't forget. When, when, you're, when, you, when you mix your sprays properly, for the most of the springtime you've got, when your sprayer is on, it's properly mixed and it works just fine. But right when your sprayer sputters right at the end, the last bit of water and foam coming out of that sprayer, the chemicals are concentrated in the foam. So we always get this burning. And the last rose I spray always gets burnt up. <laughs> so I, and I forget about that now and then. So when you're getting to the end of the spray, just spray the last bit of spray on the ground. Don't spray the rose with it because it's more concentrated than the beginning part of that spray. Well, actually, I, you know, I first turn my spray on, I spray the ground too because it might be oddly concentrated in there. It might not be proper mix. And then the last bit you should spray on the ground too. Don't empty your spray out on the rose <coughs> because the foam is concentrated. Fertilizers that have a systemic uh, insecticide in them, you know, ortho and you buy like and that. Right. Do you recommend systemic? Uh, there is a, a place for it. So the last bug we'll mention is the reason why we'd still use it. So the new bug in town, which has been around for what about six or seven years now, is called the chili thrip. It looks like the other two. I mean, it's really hard to tell a difference. But now, fortunately, we are here in coastal Southern California. A chili thrip seems to operate once the temperatures are at 85 degrees for an extended length of time which last year didn't happen until mid-August. Like if you're in Florida or Texas, they start dealing with this bug in May. It's 85 degrees in Texas and Florida, and it doesn't drop below 85 until October. I mean, if you've ever lived in the deep south, um, you know, in daytime it's 98, <laughs> nighttime it's 90, 90 degrees. <laughs> it's like, it is warm along the Gulf Coast. So the chili thrips like the heat. Uh, some years they don't come till late. Some years they can come earlier, but it's usually like 85 degrees. It seems if the weather's consistently 85 degrees or warmer, they're out. The chili thrips don't just go after the flowers. They go after all this new growth. So, you know, they, they're apparently they originated in India. They wiped out the chili crops there, they worked their way around the world came in the United States through Cuba, through Florida, across Mexico, into California. And, um, and what, what some people have told us last fall, my roses haven't bloomed since summer. What's wrong with them? They, they must be sick or something. Well, they can't see it. So if you take a, you know, if you see a chili thrip involved stem, all the leaves are, they look like they've been diced up, diced and what the chili thrips are doing, and they're making little cuts throughout all the foliage here. So this, all this stuff's been cut up, it's leaking sap, it, it's shriveling up, it look, turns kind of grayish, it looks totally bad, it just won't grow. You can take this stem and slap it on a piece of white paper, because you really can't see the chili thrips real well under there, the size of slivers. Just slapped on a piece of white paper, 
and you're capably covered with 50 or 60, off one stem, 50 or 60 little things just walking around. So they're, they're just dining on this thing. They're, uh, they suck out, they're almost like spider mites, they suck out the contents of the cells. And the whole plant's leaking. So uh, all the new buds are destroyed, the leaves are destroyed, everything's destroyed on the new growth. If there's enough of them, your plant just won't grow at all until it gets cool again. The chili thrips, we don't know what happens to chili thrips in winter. I haven't seen any, I haven't seen the latest research on them, but they show up when it's hot for a while and they go in now. The, the most effective controls, according to the University of Texas, have been spinosad, which is nice because this is organic. So spinosad will kill 95%. Unfortunately, it won't kill 100%. It kills 94, 95% of all the thrips. So in other words, if you use this a couple times and you keep using it, the only chili thrips that are left are the ones that are unaffected by this. And then they come back in big numbers. So you have to alternate it. Now, if you want to be organic, you alternate with an oil spray like the neem oil. I, in fact, we have other oils in the back there, the Dr. Final Stops, uh, six different oils in there, plant oils in there that are that are very safe around people. Um, you can try that. The, we just hope, you know, oils aren't great at killing thrips. We're hoping they kill the 5% that the spinosad doesn't kill. So that's the big hope is that you alternate weeks. This one week, this, this last two weeks, hit it with something else the next week. Now, in Texas, they said the best product was imidacloprid which also kills 95% of the thrips, hopefully not the same 95 that the spinosad kills. So they said if you alternate these two, uh, two weeks, or two times with this, two times with this, two times with this, two times with this, it's what they're telling the nurseries to do, um, then you won't have a buildup of chili thrips in your yard, you won't see any. This Bayer product here, Bayer made a lot of money because they made this product with the imidacloprid in it as a systemic. So you put this at the base of your rose for six weeks, it sucks up this chemical and you won't get the chili thrips. Now, uh, unfortunately, it's only one product, so uh, you might have to supplement it by doing this once in a while. The bad thing about this is the imidacloprid that's in here was falsely accused, we'll say now, falsely accused of killing beehives. It kills bees on contact, it kills bees if they suck the nectar with us. Now roses, you know, most roses, the bees don't get in there because there are too many tufts. So they're not the biggest bee plant. You know, rosemary, sages, they're more bee plants than roses are. Um, but they said that this will kill bees, but it won't kill the hives because the bees don't make it back to the hive and most bees that are foraging are on their last days of their life anyway, so it's not a big deal to the hives, but it is a big deal to the native bees. So we'd rather not use this if we can because most native bees are solitary insects. If you kill them, their brood's history. So we're losing native hives if you use this all over the place. Again, rose is not the big deal. I mean, we carry this because of the non-blooming plants we can use it on, like ficus, get all these thrips now. They're, they're getting ficus trees. You put this on a ficus, they don't have flowers. The bees aren't, uh, you know, aren't gonna visit it. Uh, so if you have a 30-foot ficus tree, you can put this on the base of it. It'll kill all the bugs up in the ficus tree without hurting too many things, other things around. And the other thing about imidacloprid, really safe around animals, mammals, excuse me, mammals. Insects, bad mammals aren't affected much by this chemical. That's why they don't want to toss it out, even though it's implicated in, has been implicated in bee death, they can't get rid of it because you can put this on your pet and kill the fleas without hurting your pet. Very safe around mammals. So that's why they're struggling with this chemical. They're making new versions of it that maybe aren't as bad for bees. So it's, um, so it's still around. It still has its purpose, but be careful how you use this one. And, you, and definitely don't use this if you're growing vegetables, although again, it 
likelihood to hurt people is very low. It, it's very non-toxic to mammals. But anyway, that's the story on the thrips. So thrips, we have to watch for them, you know, the, in spring for the flower thrips, in the summer and fall for the chili thrips. And chili thrips can definitely shut your rose down totally. Now, it's more problem in rose gardens than it is in single roses. So again, if you spread your roses out, they don't seem to get chili thrips so bad. Like at my own house, I've got three roses that don't spray them at all, uh, my current house. And I don't think we've seen rose chili thrips there at all. I don't recall seeing any damage from chili thrips. There's just not enough <clears throat> rose in that spot to attract them. Uh, but in my neighborhood, I see rose gardens that are totally devastated. So, yes. When you have a rose garden and your roses are about three feet apart or whatever the distance is, can you plant something in between or are you disturbing the root system of the roses? Because they're kind of bare looking. Right. So we do like to underplant roses. It, it makes sense to put lots of plants around it. That that again that lowers the bug and the disease prevalence just mm -hmm. to have other things in there with it. What plants work well? Uh, you came late. <coughs> you promoted this one. Uh -huh. This is I've seen this used in a lot of rose gardens. Uh, geranium tiny monster stays around eight inches tall. Spreads about five feet wide, blooms all year, heaviest in the spring. <clears throat> okay, I don't think there's any other, oh, okay. So once a year we prune roses heavily, or traditionally we prune roses heavily. It's not really a tradition, you have to fall that carefully. So traditionally, you know, if you're back east or anywhere north, it's after the snow thaws and the danger of frost is over, you go out to your roses and you see what's dead because of the frost and all that and what might have been damaged by snow blowers and whatnot. We don't have that problem here. And traditionally in Southern California, it's been done December, January. Well, someone from back east commented in the, in the newspapers, they said, why do we do it so early? I mean, our worst weather is winter the rain causes rust and black spot. Just wait till the rain's over. So this was in the 80s. So I said, well, that makes sense because if I prune my roses in December and the new leaves come out and the rain hits them, they get rust and black spot. So I decided to wait until the rains were over, which is usually early spring. Right about now, I noticed my rose plants, no matter what, were putting all this new growth, starting to grow all this new growth. So I would just cut off all the bad leaves cut them back at that time and be fine with that. Wouldn't have to, and then the new leaves would take about a month to really get prone to disease and by the time the rains were over, and I don't have to do it once. So I didn't have to clean them up twice after the rain caused all this disease on the, in the winter, I would just do it <coughs> once and be done with it. So ever since then, I've, if I had cut my roses back, I'd do it in the spring. And depending on the weather, you know, it's, we had some hot winters where I'd do it a little earlier. And in the old days, back in the 80s, I would do it in April because the roses really didn't push until April. It was so cold in, in the winters in those days. When you say pruning, I've been taking all of the leaves off. Is that what you mean by pruning? Well, yeah, well. I just kidding. What, so I, I started compromising because I said, well, this rose leaf looks fine. I don't have to prune it off. If it was had a disease on it, or if it was half brown, I would just take it off. Yes, it looked better without it. But if the leaf was perfectly healthy, there, was, is, there really isn't a reason. Now, one thing about uh, pruning roses and cleaning up your rose garden, in the old days, we were really thorough until research proved otherwise. So in the old days, they would, you know, you cut your roses back, take all the leaves off, and sterilize your rose bed with a product called um, lime sulfur and then in Texas they decided well let's check and see if this actually makes a difference so they did one side with the lime sulfur and one side without and no difference they said well apparently there's so many rose disease spores floating in the air in the US it doesn't make a difference if you sterilize your bed or not so at that point we stopped sterilizing the bed 
there's no reason. They said even dead rose leaves on the laying on the ground don't have much disease, <coughs> living disease on them. The, the leaves when they're on the plant and they're diseased, that's when the disease spores are released. Once leaves are on the ground, the fungus and bacteria on the ground start consuming the rose spore, the disease spores that are there. And you don't have to worry about them once they're on the ground. So there's no real reason to sterilize the bed anymore. So we stopped doing that when we saw all that report. It says, okay, that doesn't make sense either. Now, some people, in, well, okay, English roses. So in England, David Austin made English roses more popular. Now this is not English rose from England, but it's got that same style where you have a, uh, this is a quartered bloom where there's no distinct center. So in the US for a long time, we wanted at the rose shows, roses that had a distinct, you know, we wanted a pencil point center on the rose, a classic rose form <coughs> to win rose shows. The name David Austin made the old fashioned roses that didn't have the censure real popular. And he said in his rose book, do not prune my roses for at least four years. We need to build up thicker stems to make the better flowers. And so what's interesting is that his plant in California, we had always cut a rose really short, got rid of the old stems, kept the new stems. Uh, so that there wouldn't be any old stems ever on your rose plant. Every winter when we cut them back, or spring when I cut mine back, I would keep the new green stems that were growing and cut off the old stems. They said the best flowers came off the new stems, not the old stems. But someone, there's this gentleman, I, I met him a few times, or I talked to him a few times. He had been hired at the um, Huntington Rose Garden to prune and take care of their English rose garden. You know, they had a new English rose garden and they had the old rose. So he decided he would not cut the American roses the way that he had been taught. Do it the same way they do the English style roses. Just leave them real tall in the winter, four foot tall. So I went there to look at the garden in the spring. You know, those stems on those roses are like this thick. They're all barky, just like the English roses were. And he claimed that they had five times many flowers for the first bloom than if you cut them short, of course, because you had all these big stems. Well, I look at the rose that goes, I don't recognize these, I look at the names. They all look like English roses. So what happens is as the stem gets thicker, you get more petals. So we had a double light there. I hardly recognized it all. It had like 100 petals on it. Didn't look like double light at all. The colors weren't right. <clears throat> the paradise there, nothing looked like the pictures anymore. They all looked like English roses. So apparently, the older the stems and the thicker the stems get, the more petals you get, and the more they look like English roses. And if you cut them and hack them so they have new growth all the time, they have fewer petals and look like American roses. So it's, it's what you want. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want, you can get by the way you prune them. But that was real interesting that he did that, uh, and that uh, that he showed us that that's how it works. So English rose, yeah, you don't cut them because you want more petals. You don't prune them at all. He didn't prune them much at all, so he just left the old canes. Well, when he retired. Tom Carruth, who was the breeder at Weeks Roses, which developed most of these roses, he went in there and he cleaned it up and he said, ah, this is terrible. Get back to what we're supposed to do. So he was, he's more of a traditional guy. And I think the rose, you know, if you go to Rose Hills and Whittier, um, that's one of the best rose looking rose gardens I've ever been to. In the middle of winter, they cut the roses down to about this height. They don't want any old stems out there. They're all all you see left are mainly the green stems, and they've got a, you know, they have the classic looking roses there. But again, you know, there's no wrong way to do this. Again, uh, most rose gardens now that are public are cut by with chainsaws because there's not enough volunteers to do this work anymore. So they, they have instructions how to do the chainsaw so you don't make the rose too ragged looking. You go from down, under, and up. <laughs> Instead of not top down, you go like this. Chainsaw. Yes. Is there a type of rose where a breed 
roses that are less susceptible to disease, like Florida oh, or Harbor Tea or? Yes, so um, most of the diseases on roses, a lot of the diseases were promoted when they brought the color yellow into the roses. So apparently yellow color is associated with disease. So the first yellow rose I think was one called Austrian Copper. And then they started using that to get the yellow colors in the roses and suddenly all the roses were getting black spot and, and all these other diseases because of that. So what they did is they went back to the wild roses and got roses with no yellow gen, gen X at all. And that's how they made uh, Knockout and this um, uh, flower carpet rose. Apparently no yellow genes in here. So these roses don't get a lot of the diseases that the other roses do. So they're, they're working with that. They're trying to get a line of roses that won't pick up the diseases because they've eliminated that color. Okay. Um, how about how, oh, a, a hybrid tea compared to a floribunda? Is one less susceptible to diseases? No, the difference in roses is real minor. So, in fact, uh, you know, the difference between hybrid tea and a floribunda is just the way they look. Uh, so, like, this is a hybrid tea, but it's trying to be a floribunda. Mm -hmm. right. When there's any rose, if it's really strong, it puts out more than one flower per stem. So what you would want to do to make this rose look its best is pick off some of these side buds as they grow so that it only makes one bud. Because if you, like we had a rose called a long time ago, the best white rose, it was called Honor. Well, it wanted to make 20 flowers in each stem. And if you let it make 20 flowers in each stem, the flowers look just like this. They had like six or eight petals in each flower. But if you dug out all these little side buds, so you only had one bud, it had 30 petals. That was a lot of work to get your fingernails in there and pull those things out of there before they got big enough to cause this to have fewer petals. So, so the hybrid teas aren't really hybrid teas necessarily, unless, you know, sometimes they, they force it, you know, they said, okay, it looks best if you have one flower, so it's a hybrid tea. But like this one, if you took off all the side buds, that one flower would just be, you know, have a thousand petals on it. You know, there's just no way. This one looks better as a cluster. So it depends what it looks best as. So, you know, the kiss of death in market, rose marketing is if it's a grand of flora, it's, it's hybrid tea like, but it's got too many petals to be hybrid tea, so they let it be a grand of flora. No one buys grand of flora because they're not good for cutting and they're not good for. Sh or landscaping either they're better well they're in between mm -hmm. so a lot so if you call a rose ground floor suddenly it doesn't sell anymore so uh, how about the wax and leaves isn't that less susceptible does that tend to be less susceptible to disease yeah the waxiness is is associated with compared to uh, that to this one right which is more the waxy leaves were originally associated with no fragrance also so the more waxy the leaves were, the more waxy the petals were, and the less fragrance came out of the flower. Until, uh, so there was a breakthrough rose in 1980, what was it, 84 or 8? Uh, one called New Zealand, uh, which is um, the mother of this one called Barbara Streisand. I believe it's the mother. The first waxy leaf rose with super good fragrance and a long lasting flower. So up until then, the roses had, that had fragrance didn't last very long because they didn't have any wax, enough wax on them. And then when New Zealand came out, it was suddenly super strong fragrance, real waxy, everything was good. So they started breeding, using that as to breed all the modern hybrid teas. So they're both waxy leaf and fragrant. So that, that, that was a combination that was hard, to, you know, took a long time to come by. <coughs> And they're less susceptible to disease? Generally, no. yes, but not perfect. I mean, downy gets any rose, rust gets any rose. Mm -hmm. Certainly less susceptible to mildew. Right. Mildew doesn't like that wax as much. And that, and that is our main disease. So mm -hmm. yes, if you have a rose with real wax leaves, generally you let, get less mildew than the ones with matte leaves, like Double White has matte leaves. That gets more uh, mildew.
doesn't get any black spot though. <laughs> I mean, it, it's less susceptible to certain other things. So, any other questions? I just rub off the mildew around the rose because I like to cut my roses and put them around the house. Yeah, in fact, one, one time in my house, I had, I had the rose called Touch of Class, real bad mildew, gorgeous flower. I wanted to see what the mildew actually did to the rose, so I didn't treat it. And so it was sitting there with buds filled with mildew, okay. and it didn't do a thing. The buds sat there un, unopened for like three or four months. I'm going, yeah, it just stops growing. <laughs> so I cut it off, and then it's starting to make new leaves and new flowers. But the mildew just shuts the darn thing down. It won't open, won't do one thing. That was, that was interesting. I thought, it's got to do something. But it just sat there for four months with the same buds covered with mildew. It wouldn't move with, with that much mildew on it. So, it, yeah, it does, it does affect them. Of course, you can just cut it off. So, like with the oils, when you're treating with the oils, <clears throat> we like to treat the mildew within two weeks of when you see it. If you wait two weeks and then treat with oil, it doesn't cure it. Just cut it off, get rid of it, and it'll regrow a new, a new stem. Uh, but if you can get to it with the oil quick enough, this will cure it. Oil just lifts the mildew right off the leaf. It's an, it's an exterior fungus. It doesn't actually reside within the leaf. So it doesn't kill the stems like some of the other diseases do. Yes. Sometimes you wait too long to repot or replant our roses. It's a bit of a root system. Do you cut off some of the roots or do you just spread them out, untangle and spread? Well, um, you're always, you know, when you do anything, you're damaging the rose, the rose roots. I mean, you can do like my father did. My father was a bonsai artist, so what they do is minimum every 10 years, they pull the plant out of the pot and use chopsticks and try to pull a lot of the dirt and the dead roots out of there. Uh, getting rid of maybe half the soil total, put in new soil, trim the plant back, but you just put in the shock by damaging the roots, and then you're fine. You go again another 10 years. So that's how I used to do bonsai, and you can certainly do the same thing with roses. In fact, with rose beds, one of the treatments for rose bed is to put, dig a trench along the front of it, put new dirt in there so that you have place for new roots to grow. So plants in general like roses age because they tend to fill the, the soil around them with just dead roots. And then once they get real bad, the top gets real ugly, stops growing, and then it's time to put in a new rose. But sometimes you can get around that just by trenching in part of their bed and putting new dirt in. So that is a standard practice in some rose gardens to trench put new soil in instead of putting new roses in. So. Is there a thornless rose? For a while there were was a line of thornless roses. So someone named Harley Davison, not Davidson, like the motorcycle, but Harley Davison up near the Bay Area was, had a line of smooth roses. They called Smooth Angel, Smooth Prince, Smooth uh, Princess, and they were thornless. Uh, they might have one thorn every now and then, but they didn't catch on. They weren't as quite as pretty as the other roses, and most of them didn't have much fragrance, so they didn't catch on. And we have we saw one rose that's fairly thornless. It's the uh, one called Ink Spots. It's the blackest rose you've ever seen, and I've never seen disease on it. It's like it's the whole thing is made out of leather. <laughs> it's really a uh, heavy, heavy. I mean, I think that's why the rose is so dark because the petals are super thick on it. Um, but I, it doesn't seem to have many thorns on it at all. Is it fragrant at all? No fragrance. Doesn't even look good open because it doesn't <laughs> open properly. It's, everything's on it. It's real, it looks great in a, ba in a vase, bud vase. Mm -hmm. you know, fabulous color, but it doesn't open real well because it's, the, it's so heavy. Maybe during a heat wave it'll open just fine. Okay, yes. I have one more question. In regards to using your all seasons oil, I don't want to kill the bees. I'm really conscious about that. If I've seen uh, mildew on one, is it a good practice just to treat everybody? No, you can treat them one by one. I mean, mildew doesn't spread super fast and okay. it's not, you know, it's not real bad for a while. So 
do this treat one at a time. I mean, I used to go out there when I was actually Scramer, I used to go out there with a little spray bottle of oil and just spray the leaves that had it. Okay. And that's all I would do. Okay. And as far as growing in pots, which, I mean, they do well in pots? Or should they be moved into the ground? Well, roses, like these roses in these five gallon tubs, they really will get too big for this tub by summer. I mean, the miniature rose, maybe not, but most of these roses want to grow this wide and this tall. And what will happen is this pot will just dry out so fast you have to water it twice a day to keep the rose happy. Uh, so it's better, just easier to go to a bigger pot. Like some people put them in half barrels, which is probably bigger than it needs to be. But I would say you know, 15 gallon is a good size. So they could survive year after year in a 15 gallon. Right, just remember that the black plastic heats up that dirt. So if you whitewash it or have a lighter colored pot, they're happier or a wood tub so they don't heat up. That kind of helps them look better. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, well, you want to get it down before it gets hot. But if you want to stop the weeds, then get it down while it's raining. Okay. <laughs> well, kill it. It always hurts to pull the weeds off, but sometimes get rid of the disease. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Get another one for my, oh, absolutely. my sister. Absolutely. Thank you. Sure. We didn't have any safety. We're all taking them up. We took care of all of that. There's, there's no. I'm going to walk over there and get that. Hi.